Hi and welcome to Lawwiser, India's first video-only knowledge sharing platform for law and policy. Today we have a very interesting conversation around startups and incubator. We all know startups are really thriving in India and they are full of opportunities for them. Uh, but there is a lot of question that they have, especially with respect to incubators, their rights, and you know which ones they should be choosing. What's the hierarchy on the cap table? There are a lot of those. And to address these questions, we have uh, two experts with us. Uh, you know, to actually kind of they would be uh, sharing their perspectives from as a lawyer and also as an incubator, trying to explain all of these uh, different questions to us. Uh, so joining us today would be Mr. Vikram Portnis. He is founder at Fund Enable, a platform for startups to raise a round of capital. And we have uh, with him uh, today. We have uh, Rashi Kapoor Mehta. She's partner at Universal Legal. Welcome, Vikrant and Rashi. Thank you for taking time out for us. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Rashi, um, if you could just start our conversation um, around all, uh, you know, the relationship of startup and incubator and how crucial that is. Sure. Yeah. Hi, Vikrant. Hi. Uh, Using your years of experience in this space, these days we see a lot of you know accelerator, incubator sort of being banded around, and I'm sure it causes a lot of confusion in the minds of early stage founders. So, what would you recommend as the approach to determining who is the right incubator for me if I was a startup founder? Sure, sure. So, uh, this is a very interesting question, right? So, there are more than hundred. DST and AIC funded incubators to date, and uh, you know they are across the country in tier one, tier two cities. So the question is, how does one go about uh, you know determining the right fit between the startup and the incubator? Uh, there are three simple things that one can look at. One is actually the location, physical location, right? Uh, so it makes sense for a founder in Chandigarh to actually be associated with. an incubator which is based out of chandigarh because uh, office space is one of the uh, key uh, i would say offerings that an incubator provides right so uh, having said that uh, we've moved into uh, you know virtual incubation but still uh, it's better if your incubator host incubator is actually in the same city uh, that's number one number two is every incubator has a thrust area or an area of expertise so if you are uh, a startup which is predominantly working in the virtual reality technology space then it makes sense for you to actually be a part of the incubator which is focused on you know ar vr space right uh, the reason is uh, that incubator will have all the necessary technology hardware and software required to actually create uh, you know that technology right so uh, an agri tech startup should be actually hosted at an agri tech incubator and every incubator has a thrust area uh, all of this information is actually available on the dst and the aic website right so the first is the location the second is the th the thrust area or the area of uh, you know the technology area and the third is actually what is it that you really need for example if you require funding immediate funding then you need to be a part of the incubator that has either a startup india seed support fund or a nidhi triple s fund seed support scheme right uh, if you want funding but you are at an incubator which does not have one of these two schemes then it doesn't make sense for you because you will not be able to get that funding so similarly if you need a specific mentor specific kind of input from that incubator then that should be available right Uh, all of this information today is very easily available on uh, you know the websites uh, and even on the incubation website and that is how startup can actually uh, look at choosing the right incubator uh, so actually rashi that brings me uh, to a question which i would like to ask you is that you know typically most of the incubators take up an upfront 2 to 3% equity against the services that they offer and what are these services office space mentoring technology support access to capital etc right so uh, the question i have for you is are there any risks associated with this since we are giving upfront equity so how does a founder ensure that the incubator delivers on the promise 
So that's actually quite an interesting question, uh, Vikrant, because we, we see how this tends to play out. So I think the first thing that every founder needs to be mindful of is documenting whatever your understanding is. And that doesn't necessarily mean just carte blanche, accepting whatever documentation is put in front of you by the incubator, because they would naturally have standard forms of these. And often early stage companies, they obviously don't necessarily have um, you know, a large set of advisors, etc. But it's very important for you as a founder to understand what you're giving up on day zero. Sure. Right. So make sure that you're protected from a documentation perspective. I think the second is, you know, on the second piece that you mentioned, when you're talking about technology support, it depends on the nature of the support that's being offered. If you're a technology company, obviously, what's of greatest value is the IP that you are creating ultimately. So say an incubator like Sign, you know, you may have a professor who's helping you build out this IP. In sure. that case, does the professor enjoy rights? Uh, to your IP? Are you going to jointly apply for patents which are developed? Uh, are you licensing some portion of pre-existing technology which is owned by that incubator? So it's very important that you understand. And again, there may be commercials associated with that. You may agree to be paying a royalty going forward. How long does that continue to apply for? So these are some of the things that ultimately can come back to bite you if you're not clear upfront as to who owns the IP, what does it cost me, and, uh, you know, is there any other form of documentation that I need to put in place to record this? Sure, sure. Yeah, so, I mean, and the thing is, which, which sort of brings us back to, and what is the pound of flesh that I'm giving, right? So, how do you determine how much equity they should be taking and at what value? Is that right. taken, which is again something that you must be seeing more of. You indicated a two or three percent, but is right. that sort of par for the course, or is there opportunity to negotiate that? Sure, sure. So, so yeah, you know, uh, typical range uh, which uh, we've seen in the market is around two to three percent, uh, and this is purely uh, incubation equity. And obviously, founders do negotiate, uh, saying uh, you know, depending on the stage at which they are, right? So very, very early guys who've just started uh, the venture, uh, everything is just on paper plan right now. Uh, they end up giving a higher equity stake uh, as compared to someone uh, who requires, you know, less of handholding from the incubator, right? Uh, so this two to 3% is purely for, uh, you know, the incubation services. Uh, beyond that, when an incubator invests money in the company through their funds, right? Uh, that is when they take up additional uh, ownership in the company, right? But that ownership is defined not today, uh, but at a future date, which is typically the next round of funding. So when most incubators, when they invest in startups, uh, seed capital, when they put in, uh, you know, uh, startups, they actually uh, come in in the form of a convertible structure like a CCPS or a CCD wherein the value, the, the ultimate percentage stake that they will end up owning in the company is not determined today, but at a later event, which is typically the next round of funding. So a discount to the valuation which you are getting uh, to the next round. And obviously, if the startup doesn't end up uh, raising a round of capital in, say, three years, then there is a fallback valuation, which is predetermined. And, uh, you know, the incubator converts uh, their money at that particular valuation, right? Uh, so that's how the, the valuation uh, game kind of works in the incubation uh, space. Um, when I'm thinking about this right now, there's one question that is coming to my mind is uh, that when an incubator invests in a startup, typically what is the exit expectation of the incubator? How does the exit ride in the shareholders agreement between the startup and the incubator look like? You know, Is it as... Uh, I would say as stringent as a VC term sheet or, you know, how, how is it different and how does it look like, Rashi? So we've sort of seen the trend being changed recently. The documentation that's put forward up front would probably treat the uh, incubator on par with, say, an angel investor to start off with. But over a period of time, of course, those rights get diluted. Uh, as you know, you raise your, your seed stage investments and you get more institutional investments or uh, investors on your cap table. 
but from a founder perspective i think you know one should probably look at an incubator as somewhere between a co-founder and a strategic investor because ultimately you are parting with equity because of some value that you perceive the incubator is bringing to the table right and they, it's usually as you said because you've chosen an incubator because of them having special expertise in a particular sector so you're bringing them in for that strategic experience that they have so i think uh, you know as an incubator obviously uh, they themselves are looking at their ultimate end goal or of an exit and yes they will probably be treated uh, on part to participate in an exit but where where they will sit in say an exit waterfall for a liquidation preference in my experience is where an angel investor would typically uh, sure yeah sure so so basically uh, what you're trying to say is that from the hierarchy of rights perspective uh, an incubator actually would be uh, on par uh, when it comes to an angel uh, and you actually mentioned a very interesting point where uh, one has to look at it uh from somewhere between the founder and a strategic investor because of the value that they are actually uh, bringing to the table so uh, that's a very interesting uh, perspective actually so yeah. i think yeah please go ahead no no i'm just going to say that i mean from that point of view because there is an anticipation or a reasonable expectation that an incubator's rights will get diluted over a period of time that's one more thing to be mindful of as a founder both from a contractual perspective as well as from a relationship perspective that your incubator does not have the ability to block those future fundraises because they're being diluted in terms of their rights so sure. that's something to be mindful of sure just adding one small point here uh, for the viewers is that uh, you know a lot of lot of founders think that when an incubator is pumping in capital uh it is actually developmental money government money which is given to the incubators which is then invested and therefore uh people believe that the exit rights will not be actually as stringent uh however uh, you know uh, incubators do care about uh, the exit as much as possibly uh, the angels uh, you know on the cap table because the money that is being handed over by the government to them for investing in startups is given one time and the future startups of the incubator will have to be actually supported by rolling that capital you know the exit exit money going into the same pool and then supporting more and more uh, founders no that's very interesting but so at what stage of the exit cycle in your experience is an incubator typically happy to to get out sure so typically you know uh, obviously while uh, you know in the agreements we write about the ipo and a and a mna kind of a situation but in our experience uh, the successful exits for incubators have come in uh, at a stage which similar to angels like when when the third or the fourth round of funding happens you know by series c series d uh, the venture capital fund wants to consolidate uh, the cap table and uh, in doing so all these smaller shareholders you know few angels incubators etc they kind of end up doing a secondary uh, and uh, consolidate the shareholding right so incubators are very very happy with uh, getting an exit uh, during the you know second third round institutional round and that's when uh, actually they get their money back so one last question from me vikrant is basically is there a difference in outlook when you're talking about these government funded government set up incubators and accelerators and then the private ones you know like you have an entrepreneur first or a, one of those international or a, or a y combinator for example is there a difference in outlook that one should have as a founder while considering these sure so uh, uh, so the the most the biggest difference uh, actually is that all the government funded incubators predominantly are not for profit institutions right uh, even by the structure of it they are not for profit and they have to kind of support founders uh, and that's their job whereas most of the private accelerators etc that's their business model per se right um, uh, supporting founders coming in at a very early stage and and then taking them to the next round of funding helping them with uh the business model uh, so the primary difference is that one is actually not for profit and the other is uh the business model per se is acceleration or incubation right uh, 
because of that uh, what happens is obviously most of the for profit uh, accelerators are perceived as more aggressive uh, from from you know taking the startups to the next level perspective right uh, so obviously if someone gets into a y combinator uh, you know or one of the large uh, private accelerators then uh, a founder prefers that uh, however uh, the beauty is that even if you are at an incubator which is a government funded incubator you still can be a part of some other accelerator program so a lot of times we've seen uh, founders who are actually a part of the incubation uh, uh, you know center of one of the large institutes like iits iims uh, aics etc but they also are a part of say a shell accelerator or a microsoft accelerator or you know a, a maruti accelerator etc right so in fact that helps uh, obviously uh, in lot of cases you have to give equity to then multiple uh, people yeah. uh, and that's how it works thank you thank you vikrant and thank you rashi for that actually five side conversation on startup and incubator relationship thank you so much <laughs>